I am so glad you're here. I have been wanting to uh, fucking shake your hand since you stormed off your show. Yeah. I feel like there is not enough storming. I completely agree with I, you. I think there should be an award show for, <laughs> for called the Stormies, just for people <laughs> who have the balls to storm off. Yeah. So what is that show? We, we, that was like their Today Show? Yeah, it was the morning show, Good Morning Britain. All I'm, over Britain. All over Britain. London to Londonderry. Everywhere. Scotland? Yeah. yeah, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, everywhere, yeah. And it was, um, yeah, I mean, the blow up came because I was hired specifically to give forthright opinions. That's why I got the job. And when I gave a very forthright opinion, I didn't believe a word Meghan Markle was saying in her Oprah wine uh, All hell broke loose and the woke brigade tried to cancel me. And I thought, well, they're not going to cancel me because well, my opinions are my opinions. But of course, it turned well, out the whole you actually are not allowed opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting, England, you know, it just becomes more and more Americanized, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, completely, yeah. Like the hypersensitivity thing, which, you know, I used to think of the British as stiff upper lip. Yeah. But I remember going to England the first time, I think it was 1984, the Des O'Connor show. Yeah. You must have grown Des, up on that. Des is great. But it was like, the TV was like two channels. Yeah. Like a documentary on fucking lawns. Yeah. In, that was their prime time, right? Yes. I mean, I grew up, when I grew up, That's where you there, grew were up three, there were three channels when I grew up. Now there's obviously hundreds and hundreds. Well, we only had a few channels when I was a kid either, but at least they put entertainment on it. <laughs> at least it was Mikhail's Navy. It wasn't like a show about granite or some shit, right? Oh, yeah. And then when I, as over the years, I would go back to London, I'd turn on the TV, and then it'd be like, oh, there's the American version of this yeah. stupid fucking thing we do, whatever it was, you know, a game show, or, you know, it just got more gossipy. And I thought this was the crown to that, the, the Meghan Markle thing, because there was just so much bullshit about it, right? Well, I can't even remember. Now, what it I, was, I watched she, Sharon uh, Osbourne come on your show after. Oh, after she, yes. Because she then got fired for standing up for me. Oh, right. Because she was accused of supporting a racist. And as she rightly said, okay. what did he actually say that was racist? You of know, course, the truth was I hadn't said anything I, remotely racist. What I had done was say I didn't believe right. Meghan Markle, who, right. by the way, was lying through her back teeth. And that's what, <laughs> that's what I mean about like the way England has become Americanized. Yeah. That you can't, because she's half black, she couldn't possibly lie. Right. That's not racist. Well, <laughs> it, and also I made the point that there were lots of people on the show that day who vehemently believed every word she said. I said, well, why are they allowed to believe her? Why can they exercise their right to a belief mm -hmm when I can't exercise a right to disbelieve her. Exactly. I, said, I don't care if you disagree with me this, or if you like or if you like her or if you agree or if you agree with her, but I am surely entitled in what used to be a democracy to say, I don't believe of you. Of course. Espe and let, <laughs> let me preface by saying, <laughs> um, the sad thing is the way our country is now, that we will, just by having this conversation, we will be perceived and they will try to characterize this right wingers. Right. I'm not a right winger. Nor okay? am I. Just no, just because I don't bend the knee to the one true opinion. I call it the OTO. Yeah. That's there's the one especially since when it I can see with my eyes, this is full of shit. You know what I could see with my eyes? Oprah, it's all coming back to me. This wasn't that mm. long ago. No. I probably smoked too much pot. <laughs> but uh oh she okay, she Megan <laughs> and Harry, they go on. Oprah, which itself, you know, why do you need to do that? Mm. Okay, so the royal family is accused of racism. I'm sure the old bag has got to be a hundred. I mean, she grew up Can in- Can you not call Her Majesty the old bag? Really? I've, I've got to have some limits for my well, country. You know, Sharon Osbourne- I don't mind you trashing our television. That's fair enough, because you're right about a lot of that. Well, this, is, not, this Queen, is definitely not television. The Queen has been on that throne 70 years. Okay, but- And let's, actually, let's... I would say, of all leaders of any kind of the world, probably, despite everything, remains the most respected leader of all in the world. Okay, fuck me <laughs> for, for like, okay, it's so interesting. So you can't call no, no, uh, offensive I, names in my presence okay, without okay, me calling you I, out on it. I, fine, it, but what's so interesting to me is that Sharon Osbourne said the same thing. Yeah. Like you British people, 
It's like it's like once a Catholic, mm. you know, you like which I once was. You walk into a church and you still get a little not that I want to rejoin or anything, but there's a little spilkus because you're just in this place that was drilled into your head as a child, and it'll never you can't make it go. Is this away. a good time to say I'm a Catholic? Uh, are, are you? <laughs> I am. Yeah. Okay. But this is the same kind of thing. The yeah. queen, even though your rational mind must know this is just an incredible bunch of bullshit, mm. just the idea of royalty is offensive to me. I did a whole thing once. Of course. The, the premise that some human being calls another human being your highness, mm. I find to be incredibly illiberal. But you call the leader of your country every four years, Mr. President, right? I mean, but that's his job. That's well, so not there, your highness. Yeah, but you same, don't see a difference between your highness and Mr. President. But you, I think you're missing the point of what the Queen, the Queen's job has purely been to be a figurehead of stability. And as a calming influence through difficult times, she's actually been very effective. Okay, but role. I'm just saying that name, your highness, <laughs> should be <laughs> offensive to you. Piercing. I actually don't call her your highness. I call her your majesty. You talk to her? I've talked to her many times, yeah. You talk to that exalted, wonderful woman. She's I mean, actually very. Wait, she, you, may, she calls you like Trump calls Hannity. <laughs> that, not quite like that, but she, she's very funny. Well, she's very funny. Like, there was, was one moment I remember when we were at Windsor Castle, and she had a media party. I'm and we listen were, to you, name dropping, <laughs> name dropping castles. I love it. We were, we were in this magnificent castle, and we were looking out over the lawns. And I don't know if you're aware, they have these garden parties where twelve thousand people, completely random people, wow. turn up and the Queen just walks among them. And they're, they're held a few really? times. Yeah, yeah. And they're called the Royal Garden Party. I feel so shitty so I said, about I said to her, I said, Your Majesty, I said, can I ask you something? As you look out of your lovely, beautifully manicured lawns, I said, do you actually enjoy the garden parties that you have here? Mm. So she looked at me, she said, well, Mr. Morgan, <laughs> let me put it to you like this. How would you like 12,000 complete strangers trampling on your garden? <laughs> <laughs> so she has a sense of humor. Completely. And she's really? very, she's whip smart. When I look at America, particularly now with the fractured nature of America, the sort of slightly chaotic, out of control nature of America, and the rampant division, which is arguably worse than it's probably ever been, we have the same thing politically. We had Brexit, you had Trump. These are extremely toxic tribal political environments, if you like, where it wasn't enough to take a side. You had to implacably take a side. And I wrote a book about this last year called Wake Up. And it was really going back to the genesis of liberalism, what it was actually founded on, what it was supposed to be about, because I identify more as liberal than not, and how it's been completely bastardized over time, particularly in the last 10 years. Not only is it preposterous for liberals to want to cancel everything, because it's the antithesis of what mm. liberalism should be about. Right. Not only is it completely uh, antithetical to Democracy. I mean, democracy is supposed to be the ability to sit down with people whose opinions you don't share and to have a vigorous debate and at the end of it, go and have a drink and make right. friends, which I know you do. And I and I certainly yes. do. That's gone as well now. So these modern day In Britain woke, too? In Britain too. So the, the modern day woke liberal, they don't want debate. They just want you to have their narrow prism of life. And if you don't sign up to it, you're not just wrong and they don't just tell you you're wrong, you have to be destroyed. Everything that you stand yes. for, you have to have your job removed, you have to have your life destroyed. And that is not liberalism, that's fascism. It's a new form of fascism. So would you, got, would you have gotten canned if you hadn't walked off? Well, I was put in a position where they said to me, my employers, look, if you apologize, you can keep your job. I said, what am I apologizing for? They went for you know, disbelieving Meghan Markle. I said, but I don't believe her. No, I know. but. Can you just yeah. apologize to appease people? I went, well, why would I do that? Yeah, good for who, you. Who am I appeasing right. and why? And, oh, and, okay, so let's go. <laughs> just to be clear, <laughs> come, no, none of the viewers, I, none of the viewers of the show had any problem with what I said. Here's what I <clears throat> thought was where my antenna went up. I, I understand exactly who she is. Mm -hmm. If I was just looking at her, I would never guess she was anything but a straight up white girl. That's just, I mean, just looks. Uh, she said they showed a cl clip of her in Africa dancing mm. with African girls. And she's like, you know, we've done so much because when I go here, the girls look at me and say, someone who looks like me could marry the, you know, be where I am. Well, first of all, <laughs> they don't look like you. <laughs> uh, an interesting question would be, would Harry have married someone who mm. looked like those 
African girls they were dancing with? I mean, that's an interesting question. Maybe he would have. I mean, maybe, I think, maybe they're that. Maybe they're yeah. not racist at all either. But if you're accusing the royal family of being racist, ask that question of yourself. And then also, you know, just like, I don't think those girls had a chance to marry the, the <laughs> Prince of England or whatever she was saying. Like, they, they see me and they realize I could be where she is. I mean, there's, I, no, I there's no doubt. There, there was not a trace of racism in the British media towards Meghan Markle. In really? Fact, in, no. Oh, come on. No, no, there wasn't. And in fact, quite the reverse. In fact, I remember when they got married, the outpouring... Hey, do you have a drink? I've got a soda. You don't want a drink? Well... I mean, you can. I'm just, where's my fucking liquor? <laughs> um, it's your bar. I, mean, I, I know. I don't want to be impertinent. Ice? Uh, just ice, yeah. We've got ice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I'm telling you, <laughs> Thank you know, you. the British can drink... Like, I mean, I remember when I first went to England, every time I went, you look, one of the great things about England is pubs. Because yeah. unlike here in America, where we segregate the uh, generations, you would never see someone my age in a club mm. or even in the same bar. Mm. But in England, it's a neighborhood thing. I grew up in a pub. My parents ran a pub. Is that right? I grew up in one in, in this, on the south coast of England. Wow. Five miles inland, my parents ran a pub, the Griffin Inn, a little village called Fletching. And actually, I think the whole, my whole love of journalism and debating and all that kind of stuff came from just observing people in the pub. Because in a pub, it's like, in, certainly in Britain, a pub is the pillar of democracy. It's people from all walks of life. You'd have millionaires next to, you know, sheep herdsmen. Right. And they would be debating the issues right, of the day. It didn't matter what class they came from. It didn't matter how much money they had. As long as you could stand your round for a pint, you would vigorously, animatedly debate stuff. Right. And then you'd clink glasses and you'd have another pint. I would see people in pubs, like, passed out, sitting on the bar stool. Mm. You don't see that in America. No. You just do not. No. And they would just, and it was not a thing. It was not a thing that bothered the other patrons, the bartender. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He would literally be a like rotting a, carcass was perfectly normal on a Friday night. <laughs> really, just Drag like your mates just out. like out of it on the yeah. stool, like a nodding heroin addict. Oh yeah, I'm like, and the British actors, mm. the amount mm. of liquor, mm. all those, you know, Michael Caine, uh, oh, yeah. Richard Burton, Peter O'Toole, Peter O'Toole, like they'd bring a bottle before lunch. Mm. And then have like wine mm. at lunch, and then <laughs> and still do their lines. You and- know, Churchill used to. I mean, you know, Churchill famously through the war, he would get up, he'd have champagne, Paul Roger champagne for breakfast. He'd have a long lunch with lots of wine. He'd then have a fifteen-minute crucially power nap. He'd then carry on drinking and running the war. And then at night, he'd write voraciously. He'd write these enormous speeches which right. galvanized the nation. But he would basically drink all day, Churchill. And yet he's well, he's the greatest Briton in all the polls we've ever had. I mean, you know, I'm not saying kids do drugs or anything, but the amount of creative output mm. that was, you know, lubricated and birthed, mm. really, mm. midwived by whatever liquor, LSD, marijuana, hmm. you know, I mean, it's well, the just... the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper. What would that have been like? Not they just, just, not just they... that one. No, but I'm just saying, they... as an example of an album written on psychedelic drugs, if you took the, I, I the mean, drugs away, what would they have done, the Beatles, in that period? Club Random is supported by SignalWire. If you've been on a video conference recently, you know how it goes. Laggy, choppy video and audio. It sucks, but still not as bad as having to put on pants for an in-person meeting. But this experience doesn't have to be so bad. This experience can be amazing. That's where SignalWire kicks ass and takes names. SignalWire's tech arsenal allows developers to create better real-time video apps and fast. From the little things, like actually being able to hear subtle audio cues, to the big things, like being able to support broadcast quality audio and video for thousands of participants, SignalWire empowers developers to create more natural, real-time interactive experiences. Better remote work, remote learning, telehealth, interactive experiences for live sports or concerts. 
And with SignaWire, you can build whatever you can imagine because it provides developer tools to help you get your app up and running with a few clicks and a snippet of code instead of months of complex development work. It's been the choice of TV and film studios for remote looping and audio recording. Visit SignaWire.com slash random to sign up for a free account and receive an additional 5,000 video minutes for testing your app or integration. Go to SignaWire.com slash random. Cancel crappy video and be light years ahead of the competition with SignaWire. Go to SignaWire.com slash random. We are supported by ZipRecruiter. It's great to keep learning new skills. I'd love to learn how to do a flip on my trampoline or how to own a plant without killing it or how to leave a party without anybody noticing. That's how you stay sharp, by learning. Like ZipRecruiter, its AI is always learning. So if you're hiring, their AI gets better and faster at finding the right candidates for you. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash random. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. Then it proactively presents these candidates to you. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site in the U.S. And now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash random. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash R-A-N-D-O-M. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. By the way, there's a chair over there that's hanging on the wall. Do you mm. see that chair? Yeah. You know what that is? No. It's Timothy, Timothy Leary. He was a guest at a Christmas party I had 30 years ago, 92. And he was stoned, he's Timothy Leary, and he burned a hole with a cigarette in the chair. <laughs> so the chair was ruined. So he signed it and dated it and drew a little... Fantastic. Drunk. So it's like I could probably sell it on eBay. Yeah. But it's too precious to me. Mm. And Timothy Leary. I don't know if the kids even know who that is. Oh, he was a legend. My age group. <laughs> yeah. But he should, he's the kind of icon you, you'd hope that they would know. Mm. But man. It's they don't. Like, kids don't know anything like that. Or any. I, My, I mean, I've got four kids, three in their 20s, one 10 year old girl. Four ago. kids? Yeah. Four, three boys in their 20s. Same mom? Uh, no, two mums. Uh, the boys are the same mum. And then I remarried and had a, a daughter who's 10. But what's interesting is their knowledge of the kind of cultural stuff that meant so much to me is very limited. You know, if I try and get them animated about Paul McCartney or the Rolling Stones or any of this kind of thing, their eyes just glaze over. Well, I mean, I feel like the Beatles mm. must have some resonance just because their level of success, their pervasiveness and the But culture. if you try and talk to people in their 20s about the Beatles, it's not the same. And oddly, of course it's not the same because they didn't live through but it. But they don't get they don't get the scale of it. They don't understand the right. phenomenon no. of it. No, they All look. the musicianship, you know, I watched the the Peter Jackson get back Oh, thing. me too. It's unbelievable the musicianship. When you watch McCartney sit there and just start composing long and winding road and you think, well who's doing that now? I mean people are, obviously there are brilliant musicians, but the brilliance of the musicianship. And also, the, I thought it was interesting, the dynamic between McCartney and Lennon, which I'd always been led to believe when I grew up. McCartney was the kind of sweet guy. Lennon was the tough one. He was the one calling all the shots, running the show. You watch Get Back, and actually it's the complete reverse, which may be down to Lennon's state of mind at the time and other stuff. But, uh, of course. Now, whether that was we the case that. early on. But we knew that. Yeah, but I didn't know that quite so. Of course. Can you watch, no, watch no. it happening? Well, then you're not as much of a Beatles fan. We, <laughs> we knew he was definitely running the show from well well before that. I mean, Sgt. Pepper was his idea. Everything they were doing, John was more uh, lazy at that point and also more in, on drugs, and then he met Yoko. He was other-directed. He once said, uh, you know, Paul calls me up, and he says, you know, I've written 10 new songs, and now, God damn it, now I've got to go write 10 new songs. Mm. Um, I had an interesting I, conversation he, with Sean, Sean Lennon because I just know him a bit and we were messaging mm. each other about it. So what did you think of it? He went, well, everyone else is watching it and obviously enjoying it, he said, but I'm watching my dad in a way that I've never seen footage well, of my father, which I thought was really interesting. That to, he, to he'd me, never seen so much footage of his father. The ultimate takeaway from that Peter Jackson thing, and of course, if you're not of that era and you don't love that group, don't bother. Mm. It'll be like watching paint dry yeah. because, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 right. it's so verite. I mean, yeah. it's eight hours or something. And, but, but couldn't you have watched more of it? 
Uh, totally. I could have watched double. Well, just the idea that, you know, it's the way he set it up with drama, like they have a month, which is the truth. Mm. They have a month from scratch mm. to get together at the beginning of the year and by the end of the month to have a whole new album of 14 songs mm. and perform them. Mm. And at first, they're, it's so desultory, and you think, how is this ever going to happen in a month? And they keep Xing the things off mm. on the calendar, and it's like, of course they, they fucking pull it off like <laughs> brilliantly. But what, to me, the ultimate takeaway, and I am backed up on this by Martin Lewis, you know him, probably yeah. the ultimate Beatles expert. Uh, he asked me what I thought of it. I said this, he said, you're spot on. It was always Lennon and McCartney. Mm. It's not anything else. I'm sorry the other two Beatles, they're Beatles and we love them, but you could see the love affair is between Lennon and McCartney, mm. all the interplay. He totally ignores Yoko. This idea mm. Yoko broke up the Beatles, it's like she's not even there. He barely He's noticed always it. relating to Paul McCartney. Mm. Uh, that was the original But next. don't you think the simmering tension with George Harrison's interesting? Yes. Because Harrison actually did but, do probably arguably the best solo stuff afterwards. So he was clearly breaking out, wasn't he? He did, he did great stuff for, for yes, I think through the 70s and then he had a good album in the 80s. But you yeah. can feel that. I'm a big George Harrison it? fan. And see, Ringo, but, gets, Ringo doesn't get enough credit for that, Kevin, because you barely notice him. When it all is chaotic around them, well, you get these guys who just had the rhythm of the heartbeat of the band. You don't also, think also, Ringo? So, also, yeah, I, I love Ringo. I mean, uh, it's also the case that it's good to have a guy in the band who no one's fighting. Well, yeah, I would join you, but it's illegal for me to do that here. Do you know that? You have to be an American citizen to do what you're doing in California. You can't be a non-citizen. So who it. would do what to you? So it, it's interesting that the legalization of cannabis in however many states it is in America now, if you're an American citizen, it's fine. It's legal. But if you're not a citizen, you're governed by federal law, which remains that uh, marijuana is illegal. So who would arrest you? I don't know. But Americans just, or English, you're saying? Uh, it, would, <clears throat> it would probably be a big issue with like immigration and everything else. Because Do you still live in England? Uh, I live there a lot of the time. I've got a house in Beverly Hills, so I, I, oh. I come here a lot, yeah. yeah. But, it, but you're still a British citizen? Yes. Yeah. And you have a whole place in London? Yeah. Oh. And that's where your family's based? Yeah. Well, I've got family all over England, but yeah, he has <laughs> well, a lot of family. I thought you were going to say, you're like a trucker. I got, <laughs> I got two families. I got one here. And I, you're like, well, one, my, on, one on either well, my end. Well, my late great-grandmother, it was the matriarch of the family. When she was 90, we got together, everybody just on her side of the family into one marquee, 104 people. This is a big family that I'm from. And there's a lot of us. But you weren't poor growing up, were you? No, but I wasn't, didn't have any money. My parents, well, my parents, well, <laughs> my parents ran a country pub. They worked, they worked seven mm. days a week without much help. They had four kids to bring up. We all went to the local, the local state schools, and we had certainly had no privilege. We had no right. wealth or privilege. We never felt like we missed out on anything. And of course, life was very different then, wasn't it? I look, yeah, I that sounds my, like my upbringing. Yeah, I mean, the, the house I grew up in. My father paid, I believe, twenty four thousand dollars for it. Really? You couldn't get a fucking car. Yeah, uh, at 4% or something, whatever the GI mm. Bill was. But we lived out in Jersey. That's what people did. But it was leave it to beaver time. Yeah. You know, there was no issues in that town. <clears throat> no drugs. No. No racial issues because it was completely white. The difference, when I go to the pubs in my <clears throat> county where I came from, when I was young and my parents had one, then I grew up and went to pubs myself, you never saw drugs in the pubs. Kids would drink beer and whatever and fall over and, like you said, be dragged out. But the amount of drug taking now in the pubs and clubs in England is, I would say, what a, what a hundred drug? times. What anything, drugs? anything. Ecstasy, cocaine, marijuana, you know, not. I don't think it's necessarily... You're not against drugs, are you? No, no, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm like you. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a pretty liberal guy. Whatever gets you through the night kind of view of all this stuff. What I've been struck by is just the amount compared to what was around when I was young. But you're is, just a drinker. Yeah, I like. I just prefer having a drink. Yeah, personally. Right. Yeah. I mean, marijuana is not meant for everyone. No. Yeah. It's it only really agrees with about a third of the people. Mm. Is I believe I'm not completely pulling this out of my ass, but I'm partly just this is from my experience, and I've got a lot with it. Uh, but like some people, get uh, logy and mm. sleepy. Some people get paranoid. Yeah. And some people 
get creative and it mm -hmm. makes them high, literally high. Mm -hmm. That's the good, but that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. And if it's not you, if this does, if it's not your thing, you, you shouldn't do it. But I always think, I mean, the idea that people can drink tequila until they literally to keel over, <laughs> yeah. and yet they take some sort of high moral position about cannabis, to me has always struck me well, as of ludicrous. It's like, do you not understand the inconsistency well, of this? Well, in, in this country, I don't know if England is the same, really all the drug prohibitions were racially motivated. It was a way, it was a, it was a sly way they used to target. I mean, like oh, when it was the Chinese, it was opium, mm -hmm. marijuana, crack cocaine versus powder right. cocaine. It has always been right. a, uh, you know, subterfuge yeah. weapon of racist policies. Yeah. That I mean, I don't know about England. Is the three strikes thing still active here? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I think- Somebody asked me the other day, I, I think they're remember. trying to, I mean, yeah. It's such an insane law, isn't it? Yes, it's, well, it's so typical of the American predilection for zero tolerance, mm. meaning zero thinking. Yes. Let's just like do something where we don't have to fucking think about yeah. it. You know, where we could just, that's three. Mm. <laughs> mm. Come on, uh, hit your three and you're out. Mm. Uh, but yes, there are people who've been so The gone. third can be like a tiny fragment of whatever, right? It's like anything. Not right, your people have gone gone away or... because they stole a slice of pizza right. or something. I mean, there are there are stories like that. Mm -hmm. So you know, but I mean, don't get me started on all the fucking things about this country. That... <laughs> we are supported by Masterworks. I'm fighting an ape, and he's got a baseball cap and a gold tooth. That's the dream I keep having because people won't shut up about NFTs, and I'm over it. It takes up all the headlines. It could be telling me about actual real things to invest in. Although, through all the noise, I saw something that blew my mind. It was a startup that had just gotten valued at a billion dollars that enables people to invest in real art, not some bullshit energy-sucking digital piece of garbage. Actual paintings from masters like Picasso, Basquiat, and Banksy. It's a platform called Masterworks. They buy paintings and offer their members the ability to purchase shares of them. That way you can diversify your portfolio at a price point that works for you. Now our listeners can get VIP access to skip their waitlist. Just go to masterworks.io and use promo code RANDOM. Again, that's masterworks.io, promo code RANDOM. We are supported by Indochino. Being well-dressed for any occasion is so important. It's always the right time to dress to impress in clothes that fit you perfectly for every occasion. From work functions to going out on the town to weddings, you want to look great while you're standing there thinking, this will never last. Indochino makes high quality custom fitted suits, shirts, and casual wear, all at a great price. You can personalize everything from suits and shirts to chinos and bomber jackets. The online shopping experience is fantastic. You go on, you find your favorite look, and you put in your sizes and your custom clothes show up in the mail. My people went on my computer and ordered me some custom shirts and the process was super easy. You can choose everything about your suit, including the fabric, label, monogram, and statement linings. Love a statement lining. This season, dress to impress on every occasion with Indochino. Get $50 off on any purchase of $399 or more by using promo code RANDOM at Indochino.com. That's $50 off a purchase of $399 or more at Indochino.com, promo code RANDOM. HBO documentaries have always examined the stories that make us question the world and show us what humans are capable of. The good, the bad, and the unbelievable. On each episode of HBO Docs Club, Hosts Brittany Luce and Ronald Young Jr. take a closer look at a film or series in the HBO Documentary Films catalog that you can watch on HBO Max. They'll get updates on the stories, talk with the filmmakers, plus experts to help us make sense of each film's topic. You can listen to HBO Docs Club on HBO Max wherever you get your podcasts. You're British through and through, right? Morgan and- I'm actually I mean, Irish. Really? Yeah, my father, oh. my father was Irish. He died when I was very young. Oh. Um, I was one. Because that's my heritage. Right, so I'm, I'm actually from Galway originally oh, in Ireland, okay. yeah. Um, that's my, my heritage um, on my because father's side. 1922 yeah. is when Ireland got its independence. Right. I don't think people understand how much Ireland is a conquered country by the British. 
They did not speak the same language, mm. right? Mm. They were close, they were geographically close, mm. they looked the same, but the Irish was a completely different culture with mm. a different language, and they were subjugated brutally. I mean, mm. there was a lot of, and the northern part is a British colony. That's part of the UK. That's mm. one of the four parts of the UK. Mm. It's England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Correct. And of course, they, you know, there's a lot of British people there who want to stay. It's been a long time, since centuries, since they've been part of Britain. But it's kind of like Hong Kong and China. Shouldn't it be reunited? That's what the Chinese would say. Come on, look at, look at the map. It looks like it should be part of us. And Ireland wants it. And I don't blame them. And it really is. And at some point, it will be. It might be. And, uh, it might be. And Scotland may go independent, of course, that also might happen. Scotland has voted on its independence and said, no, we do not trust ourselves. It has, but then right. as time has gone on, more, uh, more, there's been more popularity now coming back for independence. Who knows? The Scots, have. there are people who are outsized of their, of their numbers to their influence. Mm. They have great influence. I think many of the great thinkers, mm. philosophers. Great I've writers. Read, I've read, yes, like, yeah. like a higher percentage of many in the canon are, are Scottish and also very uh, influential here in the American South. Yeah. Scott-Irish, uh, I don't want to say that that's a big part of the problem down there, mm -hmm. but it's a big part of the problem down there. There's this warlike clannish that they brought over from fucking <laughs> the old, really. But the American South, I'm telling you, has a warlike and mean quality to it uh, that that is where they get it from. And if you don't believe me, in Gone with the Wind, mm. her name is Scarlett O'Hara. Mm. Her father, <laughs> famously in the scenes he's in, I can't remember the actor, but he speaks with a thick Irish brogue. Land! Land, <laughs> Casey Scarlett! Land! It's the only thing worth fighting for, worth dying for. And then Scarlett <laughs> vows that she will never be yeah. hungry again. By the way, that movie, I gotta say, Entertaining as fuck, and the people who need a disclaimer, mm. this is the problem. You fucking babies. It's I can't 1939. Agree. Don't get me Can't on that. you just see by the film stock that things were very different? Humans are like history in general. We evolve. Just celebrate we're not racist also, anymore, if you have and to just have a, be a grown-up. You, you have to have a warning. You have to have a warning oh, about just, a comedy film. Where, well, it's not a comedy. No, no, I'm not talking about Gone with the Wind. I'm talking about just generally, you know, warnings on comedy films where a joke is said, which is clearly a joke, but not intended to be remotely offensive to anybody. Right. And even that now needs a warning at the front in case anybody's offended. What do they think is going to happen when you watch it? What happens to <laughs> oh, people? I mean, the fact they that... They sit there shaking? I the mean, fact that this generation needs a trigger warning oh, at, at a clonopin to pathetic. get through an episode of Phil, Friends. Phil, it's pathetic. It's yeah. pathetic. It's We've become a, a, a world, uh, and I've talked about this a lot, a world where it is now a premium to be a victim. It is celebrated to be weak. You see that great sporting athletes are now making more money and becoming more acclaimed if they quit than if they win. We're becoming well, essentially- Well, if you're talking about the one who got the twisties, that's not right. Well, I'm actually... Is that who you're talking about? Well, I can't that, remember her name, but... I'm actually a, not talking about... I was actually talking about the, She did not quit. Well... That they drove this... The Olympics, that sickness of taking someone as a child mm. and training them like... I mean, you're just with no humanity, really. It's just you are this, this vessel for America winning a medal. Mm. And they drove that poor girl to Simone the... Simone Biles you're talking about. Simone Biles, yeah. okay. So... She, they, I have no doubt that she maxed out to what she was possibly as a human capable of taking. Mm. She didn't give up. That, that I wasn't I actually talking not... about her on this. Oh. I was actually well, talking who's about... quitter? Who are you talking about as a quitter? I was actually talking about Naomi Osaka, the oh. tennis player. The okay, tennis player I, know, who... I know less about that. So Naomi Osaka, I know that name. It's an interesting yeah. thing for me where she just quit, th she quit in the middle of a tournament. Okay, and why? She, she quit, she came up with a lot of reasons why. It was all, you know, her mental health and this, that and the other. She then managed to make a miraculous recovery to do the Olympic flame at the Olympics about two months later. And I watched all this well, go just down. just carrying the flame? Yeah, but 
But, well, that doesn't take guts. No, but my point is, if she, <laughs> was, if she if she quit because she couldn't play a match, that's more no, than but just carrying a I flame. Yeah, but I don't really agree with you about <clears> that. And I, I'm not sure I completely agree about Simone Biles because she managed to recover five days later and take part in a individual competition, having let her teammates compete without her and lose to the Russians. So I don't entirely agree. But my, mm. my general point about it is this. I think that in both cases, and many others at the moment, there is a weird cultural phenomenon going on where it's almost frowned upon to want to be a winner. Where if you, ex if you express Th yourself- Then you're an oppressor. <laughs> yes. That yeah, in that, some way, if you, right. if, you, if you want to dominate your sport and be a champion and a winner and do what it takes well, to win. Well, let me finish. We still love winners. Come on, we just had the Super Bowl. We do, we, we like do. We like the winners. They go to Disneyland. The yeah. other losers get to weep in the water. <laughs> That's true. Okay. But let me, <clears> but, but if you now quit, if you now give up and you just embrace this new phenomenon of, well, I've got mental health issues, whatever the real reason may be, and I'm not doubting sometimes the veracity of that, but you get celebrated more than if you win. And I, I have I, a problem with that. Well, I, I, I think it all plays to this. And then everybody wants to be a victim after right. that. No, it everybody is then says, yeah. I have a little <clears throat> sniffle and they go on social media, <laughs> I want you to feel sorry for me, and I want to be celebrated for my little sniffle, yes. which means I can't now do my job. And if, by the way, if you make me do my job, you're an oppressor who is forcing me to do something against my will. And so this thing starts to spew out. Right. And, and eventually, eventually weakness becomes celebrated more than strength. Right, which is not to say that there aren't real oppressors in this not world. Not at all, all that right. there are exactly. real people right. suffering from serious but mental problems. Right, but you are correct. It is a victim culture. It, it, it is exalted. We and there's are, something pathetic about it. It is. It? It's very pathetic. Well, it's the end of the empire. Yeah, I'm told that I can't. I mean, for example, you talked about a stiff upper lip earlier with the British. Yes. I've always prided myself on having a stiff upper lip. I think it's a thing to actually, to to want to aspire to have. And what to about be, your, your <laughs> what about your penis? <laughs> what about how much pride we'll you have? Come to my stiff, stiff lower lip a bit later. But hey, the, we, uh, can, we come to our part of the part of the podcast. Here is the uh, some, here, <laughs> some people find it awkward. <laughs> But I feel is generic to what we're talking I'm about. I'm extremely relaxed if you want to talk about my lower genitalia, but I'd rather get back, if you don't mind, in the short term. Yeah. To, no, I, I agree with you. No, I just think that we are, no, we are entering a perilous period of society where weakness is celebrated and the stiff upper lip, which used to be something the Brits were admired for around the world. Synonymous but with. She, right. And, Brit. and, and we, we, were, yeah. we, we were like, that's a good thing. You know, in, in times right. of trouble, the British oh. ability to rise above this, not get over emotional, not get too down but about see, this it, is dust what, yourself but, down I and kick on. That's gone now. Not now the stiff upper lip is now right. to be condemned. I am to be yes. condemned for saluting a stiff upper lip. I, How dare I be resilient? But see, this is not to be Arnold Toynbee on you, but this is what happens to successful civilizations. You become so successful, you become weak you yeah. become it's happened to rome it happens yeah. it happens to everybody yeah. you become uh, a feet you become you become fat soft and complacent soft you know what you are yeah. you're uh, martin sheen in apocalypse now yeah. when he's captain willard in the hotel room and he's like i've been in this hotel room charlie's in the jungle he's getting stronger every day and i'm fucking karate chopping this mirror and mm -hmm. cutting my hand that's yeah. us. We're in the hotel room, hitting yes. the mirror, and Charlie. But you know, you don't want to be Charlie in the jungle. Mm -hmm. You want. You can't blame us for wanting our cushy life. Mm -hmm. But it just can't seem to stop us from getting so cushy in the mind. But we used to admire mental strength and resilience, and now we mm -hmm. seem to be moving to a place where no. to even say that you should want to have that is wrong. I mean, that's, that is somehow insulting to those who might be mentally weak or who might be you know, more inclined to be a bit oversensitive I mean, it, it, or whatever. And unless you're emoting 24 seven on social media, you know, I have a problem, for example, with the kind of the global social media days where you're told you have to do a certain thing on Twitter or Instagram. And if you don't virtue signal in that way, then somehow you're, you're identifying yourself, you're a racist, you're this, you're that. If you don't go along with the herd that's decided that's what you have to do to prove that you're not a racist. The one true opinion. And, and I'm like, right. this is absolute nonsense. Why should I do that? That's not how I prove. And they all move on a day later, straight back to the way they were before. <laughs> this is like a momentary, right. I'm not a racist, look at me, I've done my black square it's on kinda, Instagram. It's kind of it's like when an actress 
everyone when she does like a part where they have to ugly her up. Yeah. And then it was like, she was so brave. I'm like, it would be brave if she stayed ugly. Yeah. But, you know, she <laughs> she's going to be Nicole Kidman again on Monday. They're going to take the big, ugly nose yes. off. You know, the fat suit will go out in the dress. Yes. You know, it, not that acting should be something that's really brave. Anyway, Marines are brave. Yeah. People, you know, but it's kind of like that, you know? It's just, uh, you're you're going to go back to being exactly We're who just you are. I just find myself constantly feeling... What is going on with the world? Like I just saw uh, in the UK today, there was a thing about the fire service or something. They're being ordered now to use him, her, them, their pronouns, whatever. I said, okay, well, fine. Let's take this to its logical extension because pronouns are whatever you want them to be, right? So if I, if I decide I want to identify myself as a dickhead, which many people watching this might think is entirely You know correct. why they're going to think you're a dickhead? Because yeah. of the way you said those pronouns. I know. You dismissed it like... And look, I, I it's not my generation's thing either, but I get it that people, you know, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. And people, you know, they just, whatever it is, they want to be that, and it's no skin off my nose. So don't say it like they, them, that, let because then you're why, just... Let me explain why I feel that way. So I had a debate on the morning show before I, I left, and it was about the BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Corporation, paid for by... Uh, taxpayers, you pay a license fee to watch the BBC, $250, a year. Oh, every they, every UK citizen pays $200 oh, a year. they take that lolly out of your and they, paycheck? Yeah, no, you have to pay it as a license fee. How many quid? Right, it's, it's 155 <laughs> now, now quid. Now that we're in the pub. What do, you, what do you think of my pub? Right, so you, it's a pretty great pub. This is a great right? pub. It's a pub, right? right. It's so, but imagine here, if you paid £155 a year, $200 odd dollars, to watch the British Broadcasting Company. And they were sending out educational videos in which they said there were 100 plus genders. One of the genders they said existed was astrogender. Astrogender is an affinity with the stars and the moon. I'm very happy if you identify as astrogender. If you, Bill, walk out today and have an affinity with the stars and the moon, good luck to you, my friend. However, when I said, okay, that so what, so I had a couple of people there, and I said, let me just get this straight, because I'm a logical <laughs> thinking person, I think. Does that mean then that I can basically identify as anything I want? And he said, absolutely. And I said, and it should be respected. <laughs> yes. I said, great. In that case, I'd like to identify right now as a two spirit penguin. <laughs> and there was a long silence. And then the inevitable well, response was, that's completely <laughs> offensive. How dare you? I said, you're sitting here telling but me there's a hundred genders. I can go out and say I am. A, I have an affinity as a gender to the stars and the celestial galaxy. But the moment I say I'm a penguin, that apparently is the that's the bar you can't right. cross. Right. I mean, I had a similar theme. In other words, it's all bullshit. Well, so. here's the thing: in America, Weight Watchers. Mm changed its name to avoid saying the word weight. Which is bullshit. Well, I mean, like KFC, I remember did it years ago, Kentucky Fried Chicken, because mm. they didn't remind people that our chicken is mm. really probably nuclear waste or something. <laughs> I'm sure it's not. I don't mean to offend the Kentucky Fried Chicken people. I'm, I'm sure it's wonderful, pure, wonderful food. I was just kidding. You, you try to head off the lawsuits where you can. But on weight, for example, right? I'm quite happy to look at myself in the mirror and go, you should lose a bit of timber, as we say in the UK, right? right? Lose a bit of timber. Uh, I've had long COVID for eight months. I haven't been able to work out like I'd like to. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, Whoa. bad, bad, yeah. Whoa, well, yeah. you're burying the lead here. You yeah. had long COVID for yeah. eight months. So I got the Delta variant last July. Mm. And for eight months, I've got zero smell still. I have probably... 20% taste, and I have constant fatigue, which most people who've had long COVID will identify with. It's not like being tired, you're just flatlined. Any overexertion, you, you get flatlined. fine today. Right, Eight, yeah, I'm fine now, and yet by potentially overexerting in this interview, tomorrow I might be completely whacked. And well, it's a, who gives it's a, a fuck about tomorrow? Well, exactly. I, I got you now. <laughs> exactly. And it's a, it's a very strange thing to have experienced. Just, just give me another 10 minutes, <laughs> and then you can fucking die. <laughs> can we make it nine just in okay. case I do? But, um, but it's a weird thing, and I know lots of people who've been through the same thing. Not from Omicron, which is a very different variant and much right. easier and changes all the game. And were you vaccinated before you got it? Yeah, I was double vaccinated, yeah. And I, I got the Delta variant. And you still got this sick? 
Yes, and it's not. It's a weird thing because okay. you, you, I, you know, you appear perfectly normal, but actually, uh, anyone who's had it knows what I'm talking about. The, the assault on your senses and the assault on your body but, is I mean, really not to be underestimated. I mean, Western medicine loves to like divide everything up into a million different categories and then give everything a name. So long COVID, okay, I'm sure that's a thing. Mm. You know, like they love to name new diseases, but really, it's the same old thing, which is. Viruses are opportunistic. Yes. If your metabolic state is sound, yeah. Yeah. terrain versus germ theory. This is a, a fundamental argument in science, but even Louis Pasteur, the mm -hmm. father of germ theory on his deathbed, said, no, no, of course, we're not denying that there are germs. He's saying it is the terrain that the germ is in, mm -hmm. the analogy being swamps and mosquitoes. Right. Mosquitoes can't breed unless it's in a swamp, mm -hmm. right? If you're a swamp, anything can take you down mm. and will. America, the main reason America had such a bad time with this is because we were not in good health to begin with. Mm -hmm. But if you say that, people like attack you. They attack the well, messenger. Well, also, you only, you've only got 50 odd percent uh, vaccination. The UK no, has. no, higher than 50 here. What is it now? Oh, in the, uh, it's in America? High, way higher than 50. In America? Yes, but you know what? We were told at the it's beginning. It's a lot higher. I think whatever it is, I think it's very close to where they said if we had that, we'd be, a, we'd be at herd immunity. But, and but, when you combine it with the number of people who have actually had it, yeah. I mean, I think we must have passed herd immunity by now. So there's a, a saying that certainly would be apropos of someone with the old stiff upper lip mm. in his background, which is fa a fate worse than death. Mm. That was a concept forever. Mm. I mean, it's a meme, or it would have been if they had memes back <laughs> in the day, but a fate worse than death. The, the, just the idea that, you know, as bad as death is, yeah. and we're not for it, yeah. there are some things that are even worse. That's completely gone. That, to me, is what this, first of all, it's so scary that they could foment the, this amount of hysteria, not that COVID wasn't real mm. and couldn't take down anybody. We don't know everything mm. about it, but... You know, I did a thing recently. I just said, why didn't we focus on what we know? It 75% are people over 65. Yeah. It kills older people. Well, that's sad, but older people, they're going to die at some point. I don't want them to die. I don't want anybody to die ever. Mm. But Earth is a timeshare. Mm. You know, we can't all be here at, some, at right. the same time. Some, so I don't want anybody to die ever. But, you know, the flu kills people. Mm. Think, uh, and then... People who aren't vaccinated, like 99%. All you gotta do is get vaccinated and you're not gonna die. Yeah. It's not that hard. And then of course, obese is 78% of the deaths and hospitalizations. <clears throat> we know where are the areas we should address helping those people. Yeah. But that's not how we do it. Because we are stuck in tribal mindset. And it's right. the same in my country as it is here. And the tribal mindset means you cannot change your position dependent on facts. And this is the key problem with what is going wrong with democracies in the UK, the US, many other places too, is that if you start to abandon the ability to change your opinion on things as facts change, what are you left with? You're left with going back 2,000 years to when we had genuine tribes. You lived in a tribe. Right. And you never came out of your tribe. So everybody in your tribe looked the same, dressed the same, right. spoke the same, had the same attitudes because they, they shared it amongst themselves. And then slowly but surely, the tribes began to move out of their own environment and they encountered other tribes. And the other tribes dressed differently, thought differently, had different attitudes. Right. And both tribes, when confronted with this extraordinary moment, decided the only solution was to kill each other. <laughs> and we have come now, we're 2,000 right. years on, but right. actually we're 2,000 years back. Oh, yeah. Where whether it's Trump or Brexit or coronavirus or vaccines no, or it's so whatever true. it is, you, mm. you feel obliged now, many people feel obliged to get into their tribe and then they cannot leave it, regardless well, of facts. There's a there's a writer for the Times, which has done so many ridiculous things about COVID, but this David Leonhardt, he's yeah. so smart, and he, he, I think, is much more on our page, and he wrote a great line of recently, he, did, he studies it, and he said something like, um, being for maximum safety has become a core part of what progressives feel is their identity. Yes. 
It's like, I'm a better person than yes. you. This is my point about- Superiority. About what I was saying about, you know, death. <clears throat> there are things worse than death. If you believe, no, there is nothing worse. Mm. And of course, we could stop more deaths if we didn't drive, if we just stayed home, if we just store, stared at our navels. If you and I never left this bar. And never And drank. all we did was do this, we'd right. have about a week from <laughs> Right, <laughs> you're in the pub. <laughs> but that, it's like, I'm a better person than you because I am for the maximum safety. Yes. And that's a, it's a reasonable debate, but that's, I would take the side, I'm not a worse person, I just think life is for the living. Mm. Uh, I, you know, to your point about people are, are you know, just pussies these days. Mm. Like, yes, there are risks all around. When I see kids, like when I'm kids, 20-somethings, walking alone outside with a mask, I want to punch them. Yeah. I'm like, you fucking, first of all, moron. Mm. You're not going to get it outside. Walking alone it's outside? Crazy. Or people in cars on the road. What a pussy. Play the odds. Yeah, you got the good immune system. And by it's the way, I say this whole thing of following the science. I'm like, go back and watch what all the top scientists in the world were saying in March 2020. Fauci was on television saying masks are no good against COVID. But can I just give what I think is the reasonable mm. view on masks? Uh, some are better than others, one yes. for one. Yeah. They do stop some, and in some instances, like very vulnerable people indoors during a surge, makes sense. Yes. But the general idea that is in people's minds that they put there, and this is what they bother me so much about, that we, the way to fight something like a virus is only externally, mm. as opposed to your immune system. Mm. You cannot avoid, and you should not even want to avoid, all the germs and the virus. You know how many viruses there are in the atmosphere? It's like 10 to the 31. They're everywhere. It's part of our ecosystem. It actually makes you more unhealthy to avoid them completely. Yeah. It's we're humans. Well, also, look at, look at what's happened with flu globally. But, so flu okay. was a massive killer globally every year. And since COVID came along, very few people have been dying of flu. And that may well change because of the immunity issues that you've talked about as we go forward. And it might be a big problem in years to come. However, you get to a position of not catching flu when you stop touching each other and you stop uh, socializing with each other and you wear masks and you have lockdowns. But who wants to live in that Life. Not me. Right? I don't want to. You don't want to. Now, there Can was a moment. Imagine doing this with fucking masks. It's ridiculous. And, and, okay. yeah. but, right. but I think, but I've evolved. In other words, at the start of all this, when no one knew what the hell we were being hit with, and places like Italy with the second best healthcare system in the world were being run over, I was like, okay, well, lockdown till we work out what the hell's going on before vaccines. That seemed to me a sensible position. Now, that's not a sensible position. Right. Now you have to, as they say, live with the virus. Right? We have to get on with it. in that drink. Okay, we're done. And when, we're not Thank you. When, we're, when we're not filming, the drinks are not free. Okay? <laughs> I'm not made of money, asshole. Okay. I was really enjoying that. That was nice. Me to too. <laughs> I, me too.